Well, I think we're headed for a disaster. I mean, I, I don't think it got better during the recovery. I think basically the Federal Reserve shot the economy full of monetary heroin. And as a result of that, we took on more debt. We spent more money. We dug ourselves into a deeper hole. Instead of solving the problems that caused the 2008 financial crisis, we just found a way to paper over uh, the, the problems and actually make them worse. And now I think we're headed for an even bigger economic calamity than the one we had in 2008. Now, many people are looking at the stock market and, you know, there are some people saying that the stock market's going to continually move up and up and up. And people are looking at this as a gauge of how the economy is doing. Is When you look at the market, what do you see happening? Is this a, an actual gauge of how the economy is doing? No, not at all. There is a complete disconnect between the economy and the stock market. I mean, if the economy were the stock market, Hillary Clinton would be the president. Because the stock market did very, very well under Barack Obama, uh, but the public, uh, you know, did not vote, you know, for Hillary because of the fact that the economy was bad and people wanted change. I think that the strength of the stock market is actually a byproduct of the very policy that is helping to undermine the real economy. One of the reasons the economy is so weak is because the stock market is strong, because what's causing the market to be strong is the cheap money policy is from the Fed. So it's artificially low interest rates and quantitative easing that fueled the stock market bubble. But that those are the same properties, policies rather, that undermined real economic growth. It really was a transfer of wealth uh, from Main Street to Wall Street. Instead of having savings and productive capital investment, we had debt and rampant speculation. So none of this is good for the economy, but it can make some people wealthier on paper if you happen to own the financial assets. And I think it's a mistake for Donald Trump to constantly tout the record highs in the stock market as some kind of validation of his policies and to claim credit for the stock market going up because we know the stock market at some point is going to come down. And, you know, you live by the market, you die by the market. And I think Trump should be distancing himself from this market. I liked him better as a candidate. He said it was a bubble. He was right then. It was a bubble and it will pop. Why do you think he's out there saying, hey, look at the stock market. Look how great it's doing. What, why do you think he changed? Well, because he can't resist. I think he's getting some very bad advice. But, you know, he's you know, he wants to claim credit for it. He's, you know, a marketer. He's a salesman. And so he's working with what he's got. So, you know, when he was a candidate, uh, you know, he was talking about the bubble. Uh, but now that it's his bubble, he wants to redefine it as a bull market. and He wants to claim credit for it. You know, just like he is bragging about the low unemployment rate. Well, when he was a candidate, he said the low unemployment rate was nonsense, that it was meaningless. It was phony statistics. He talked about with how high the real unemployment rate is. Well, none of that has changed. It's all exactly the same. But now he's spinning it in a different way. Now he's like, well, it's my economy. So now I want to talk about how great it is. But I think that's wrong. I think he should stick with the idea that the economy is not great. And it's not his fault that it's not great. He wants to try to fix it. But he's he's claiming that it's already fixed. So it's now going to look like he broke it. There's a lot of talk about Obamacare repealing it. Why is it so important for him to repeal Obamacare? I know he made these promises during the campaign, but what is his end goal here? Why does he want to repeal it so badly? Well, I mean, it was very bad legislation. It's very harmful to the economy. It is going to be responsible for driving up health care and insurance costs. So it's going to basically achieve the opposite of its stated objective. But the problem is most of the repeal and replacement bills that the Republicans uh, brought forward were almost as bad and in some cases worse. I mean, they wanted to talk about repealing Obamacare, but they actually didn't want to repeal it. They wanted to repeal it and preserve it at the same time because they don't have the political guts to tell the voters the truth about what health insurance is and that there's no free lunch. So, I mean, basically, Trump wanted to have his cake and eat it, too. He wanted to repeal Obamacare, but preserve it at the same time. He wanted to tell people that they didn't have to uh, 
buy expensive insurance if they didn't want to, but that if they were sick, they can buy insurance for the same price as they could buy it when they were healthy, which, of course, is great for the consumer because it means that there's no reason to buy insurance. I mean, why would any healthy person buy health insurance if they could just wait until they get sick and then if they need it, buy it for the same price as if they had bought it when they were healthy? I mean, that's, you know, that basically destroys the, the, the reason to buy insurance in the first place. So it's great for the consumer, but ultimately it's lousy for the consumer because it destroys uh, the insurance industry. And if the insurance industry can't make a profit, then there's no insurance. But I mean, what the Republicans wanted to do was substitute uh, premiums paid by healthy people for subsidies paid by taxpayers. They wanted the taxpayers to provide the money to pay out the claims to the sick people because the healthy people weren't going to buy any policies thanks to uh, the ban against pre-existing conditions. So the whole thing was a farce. And in fact, if you go back uh, to the end of last year, early this year, I was one of the only people out there saying that they were not going to repeal Obamacare. I said, I, I think it's going to stay. I don't think they're going to be able to repeal it. And I was right because I understood the, 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 the what, what Obamacare was. And I saw the inconsistency in what the Republicans were claiming because they wanted to preserve the, the, uh, the, the ban against discriminating based on pre-existing conditions, well, the minute they staked out that position, they were doomed because you can't repeal Obamacare without repealing that. But as we can see, Obamacare, and it's, it's this has been happening a long time, way before Trump, where a lot of the exchanges, they're going completely bankrupt, uh, losing billions of dollars. And we see that people, you know, because the premiums are going up, so much that they're just not taking it. They're, they, they'd rather take the penalty. So don't you think Obamacare is going to eventually implode on itself? Well, of course, it's going to collapse. I mean, that's the other reason that I think it was foolish for the Republicans to try to repeal it in the half-assed way that they were, because that what they were really doing was just rebranding Obamacare uh, as Trump care or with a Republican label on it. And so when it collapsed, it would have been their fault. So I do think that John McCain actually, you know, did him a favor because I think that leaving Obamacare as is and then letting it collapse is better than replacing it with something that also collapses. Because then the Democrats would be able to say, well, everything was fine until the Republicans came and screwed it up. So I think we got to, you know, we got to go down with this ship uh, if we have any, any, any hope of making some real reform. I wanted to move on to the Fed and them raising rates right now and unwinding their balance sheet. And like you said before, previously, the economy is not doing that well. Um, nothing's really changed. Why has the Fed at this point decided, you know, let's raise rates, let's unwind our balance sheet if they actually ever do it? Why did they decide to do this in an economy that's so weak? Yeah. And of course, you're right. They're, they haven't actually done anything about shrinking their balance sheet. In fact, the balance sheet is still expanding. They're still reinvesting the uh, the interest in principle. So they haven't even you know stopped growing the balance sheet, but they're still talking about shrinking it. But I think, you know, one of the reasons that they stepped up the pace or maybe the only reason that they've stepped up the pace of rate hikes, because remember, before the election, before Trump was elected, the Fed raised rates one time while Obama was president prior to the election. Since the election, the Fed has raised rates three times. And, and so the question is, why are they raising rates so much faster now under Trump than they were under Obama when the economy is certainly no stronger today than it was then? And in fact, by most objective measures, the economy is weaker now, not because of anything Trump has done, but that was just a trajectory that we were on before Trump took office. The economy was weakening, the stimulus high was wearing off, and the hangover was going to set in. So the question is, why was the Fed so timid and so data dependent? And they just used the weak data as an excuse not to raise rates. And, you know, why have they been raising? And, you know, there's really only two possibilities. One is because the stock market is so strong. And you can say that, you know, they really were market dependent, not data dependent. And so it's the stock market that is giving the Fed the confidence to raise rates. And the other explanation is that it's Trump. Uh, when 
Um, Yellen, when Obama was president, the Fed wanted to help the economy, wanted to keep it propped up to make Obama look better. And they wanted to make it easier for Hillary Clinton to get elected. Uh, so they didn't want to be too aggressive with the rate hikes, knowing that that could tip the economy into recession. Uh, but once Hillary lost and Donald Trump won, I mean, I don't think Donald Trump has a lot of friends at the Fed. Certainly, he doesn't have a friend in Janet Yellen, and he's made it clear that he's probably not going to reappoint her. So at this point, I mean, they may feel, well, you know, Trump is the perfect fall guy. We can raise rates, and if the economy falls apart and the market falls apart, people aren't going to blame us. They're going to blame Trump. So uh, it could be politics or it could be the market. There's no way to know for sure. And it could be a combination of both. When you were predicting uh, the credit crisis and the housing uh, market falling apart back in 2005, 2006, 2007, they were raising rates back then during that period. And then all of a sudden they stopped and they started bringing them down. Do you see similar similarities right now that they're doing the same exact thing? Where The, the first similarity is that they slashed rates in the first place. I mean, that the, the problem for the housing market was not that they raised rates. The problem was that they lowered them in the first place. And if anything, they raised rates too slowly. While they were slowly raising rates, more and more, you know, mortgages were taken out with teaser rates. You know, the, 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 the more and more subprime uh, mortgages were originated. So had the Fed raised rates quicker, they would have pricked the bubble quicker and the bubble would have been smaller when it pricked. So, you know, there wouldn't have been as much air to come out. So, yeah, the Fed has made the same mistakes this time around, only bigger. This time they left interest rates lower for longer. And this time they're normalizing them at a much slower pace. So they they inflated a much bigger bubble when they were cutting rates and, and keeping them down. And they've allowed it to expand because of an even slower pace of increase. But ultimately, we're heading for the same type of disaster, except the one that's coming is going to be much larger than the one we had in 08. Now, wh why do you say it's going to be much larger? What, what are you looking at to, to say that, you know, things are going to be a lot worse than they were back in 08? Well, you know, the bust is proportionate to the boom or not necessarily to the size of the boom but to the amount of artificial stimulus required to create it. I mean, so an analysis would be just a drug use. I mean, if you use a lot of drugs and then, you know, you go through withdrawal, right, then, you know, you have a certain, your, your hangover, or maybe just alcohol. Maybe that's easier for most people to relate to. If you get a little bit drunk, maybe you're, you're a little bit hungover. But if you get completely plastered, uh, then you're, you know, you're thrown up in the toilet bowl and you have the dry heaves and, you know, you're, you're really, you know, so, you know, the more alcohol you drink to get drunk, the worse it is when you have the hangover. So, you know, you look at what we did in 2000, you know, what, what we did to inflate the housing bubble, we had interest rates at 1% for about a year. And then over the course of two years, we raised them back up to 5%. And, and that was enough to do the housing bubble, right? Or a year and a half at, at 1% and then, you know, a couple of years to raise them. Um, here we had 0% for eight years. We had three rounds of quantitative easing. And then we finally started to raise rates, but we only have them back at 1% right now. I mean, we've only managed to raise them to the level that we slashed them to in, you know, 2002. So this is much more, you know, stimulus. I mean, a much bigger dose of this, you know, monetary heroin than we had last time. And so the distortions, it's the artificially low interest rates that distort the economy. And when rates go up, the market tries to repair the damage that was done, all the malinvestments and misallocations of resources. And so the Fed has done far more damage. We have a lot more debt now than we had back then. Uh, we have, you know, corporations have more debt, households have more debt. Now, you know, you have to take out mortgage debt because if you count mortgage debt, you can't see the big increase in household debt. But that's because home ownership is at a 60-year low. So a lot of people don't have houses anymore, so obviously they don't have mortgages. Uh, but they still have to pay rent, and rents have been going up. But meanwhile, we have record credit card debt, record student loans, and record auto debt. So the public is loaded up with debt. The government, the federal government has a $20 trillion debt. That's an all-time record. Uh, also, individual states are loaded up with debt. 
So every aspect of our economy is is loaded up with much more debt than we had in 2008. And all the banks that failed because they had too much debt have even more debt now, right? All those too big to fail banks are much bigger today because we bailed them out and they have much more debt and they're much more vulnerable to increasing rates than they were back then. So, you know, all the problems that created that crisis are many times worse. So we're talking about an economic event that is, you know, larger by an order of magnitude than the OA crisis. And, you know, that one gave us the worst recession since the Great Depression. This one will probably give us the worst recession, including the Great Depression, which means, you know, I guess we'll have to call it the Greater Depression. If it's going to be worse than the Great Depression, we probably can't call it a recession. Peter, I'm going to ask you this question because a lot of people, you know, they, they continually say this, you know, we've been through this economy for what, eight years now. And people say, well, yeah, you talk about how things are getting worse, getting worse, you know, and nothing has happened yet. You know, what do you say to these people that are looking at the economy who are feeling like everything is fine? There's euphoria in the market. And we, you know, you, myself and others are continually telling everyone that there's problems in the economy, but nothing has happened yet. What do you say to those people? Not true. I mean, Donald Trump is president. I mean, how did he get to become president? Because everything is great? Because, you know, people are satisfied? I mean, Donald Trump won um, a lot of blue collar voters, a lot of Democrats who had been voting for Clinton, for, for Obama, uh, voted for Trump. You know, why were so many blue collar uh, workers, if things are so great, why did they cross party lines? You know, why, why did, why did they vote for Trump? I mean, yeah, I would say that his, his election, uh, is pretty good proof that things are not as doing as well as, as people believe. Also look at retail, retail sales are collapsing. This is the worst year for store closures, uh, and bankruptcies. Uh, including 2008, 2009. And this is not just because of Amazon. I mean, Amazon's been around for almost 20 years. Why all of a sudden are all these stores just, uh, you know, closing down? You know, uh, people are broke, you know, and, you know, you look at the number of people on food stamps, on disability. I mean, these are still near record highs. I mean, we're not that far below the peaks uh, from the depths of the Great Recession. So why why didn't all these people, you know, uh, get off of welfare, get off of food stamps? You know, why are they still on the dole? Look at the labor force participation rate. It collapsed. I mean, why are so few people actually in the workforce? If we've had this great economy, why haven't we created good jobs that would entice people back into the workforce? They're not. I mean, and why are so many people working part-time jobs, not instead of full-time jobs? Why do so many people have two and three jobs? Why are a record number of people in their 70s and 80s still working? Why can't they retire? You know, why are they why are they forced to work? You know, so all this is a sign that the economy is is weakening, not strengthening. Is there any way to reverse this? Can Trump? I mean, he made a lot of promises uh, during his presidency when he was campaigning. And then after he was inaugurated, where he says, oh, this manufacturer is bringing jobs back, that jobs, you know, those are coming back. He continually did this. I mean, it was great press. But is there a way that he can possibly reverse all of what has been done? Yeah, it's there is a way. But politically, it's a very treacherous road that nobody wants to go down. I mean, it's nothing that the government can do. It's simply what the government can undo. The government is responsible for the sluggish economy. But in order for the economy to get better, it's going to have to get worse first. I mean, that's just like, you know, get back to the analysis of, you know, somebody who's a drug addict. You know, you want to get off of drugs and you want to, you know, have a more productive life. You're going to go through rehab. I mean, things are going to get worse before they get better. I mean, that's that's the case you know, for a lot of people. I mean, even if you're an individual, if you've been spending too much and you're and you're broke, you know, what do you have to do? You got to, you know, you got to cut up the credit cards. You got to ratchet down your lifestyle. You got to start saving more. You know, you got to work harder. So things things are going to have to get darker before they get brighter. And therein lies the political problem, because nobody wants to advocate that. Nobody wants to level with the public about the fact that it's going to have to get worse before it gets better. They want to promise immediate relief. It's almost, you know, like, you know, somebody selling, uh, you know, a weight loss system. I mean, 
it, it's you you can sell a lot more if you just promise you know hey rub this cream on your thighs and the fat's going to go away right you don't have to exercise you don't have to diet that's what the public wants a gimmick a quick fix right what what trump has to say is no 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 that's not going to work there is no quick fix we have to go on a diet we have to exercise but if we do this stuff then we're going to have you know a good result down the line but yes you know no pain no gain well that applies to the economy no pain no economic gain but again nobody wants to uh, be the bearer of bad news nobody wants to acknowledge the pain so that here we are right we just continue to rub uh, you know you know cream on our on our thighs and expect the fat to go away but it doesn't and if we keep eating and we don't exercise we just get fatter and fatter you mentioned uh the banking system before um, the the fed you know did their stress tests and they're saying that what the 34 banks they they passed the stress test the banks are strong but we see what's happening in europe banco popular and many other banks uh they're in trouble we see bailouts or bail-ins whatever they want to call them how strong are their banks right now can they weather this storm well i don't think the banks are very strong i mean i you know, I'm very suspicious of the banks, you know, because the banks have really, you know, been propped up with low interest rates. And, you know, a lot of people are optimistic that as rates go up, they think it's good for the banks because they think, oh, the banks will get a better spread, right? They're going to earn more on their deposits. But I keep looking at the other side of it. What happens to the value of their financial assets when interest rates go up? What happens to the viability of the loans that were made when interest rates were low? What happens if a lot of the people who borrowed money can't afford to pay it back in a higher interest rate environment? What happens if the collateral that they pledge for their loans loses value in a higher interest rate environment? So what happens if the banks end up with massive losses? <laughs> and of course, how are the governments going to bail these financial institutions out if they're also trying to tighten monetary policy at the same time? So. There are a lot of problems. That's why I don't own any of these banks. I mean, I don't have any investments in, 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 in the financials anywhere in the world. I'm just, I've just been avoiding them. And, you know, obviously they, they've done okay. And, you know, they, and, you know, and so I would have been okay if I would have bought them. But yeah, they, they, the financials did okay in uh, 2006, 2007, but they got decimated. I wanted to switch over to um, gold and silver, the precious metals market. And, you know, we've been seeing gold and silver. They really haven't moved for many years. It, it To me, it seems like they're keeping them at this one level. Um, even though the dollar is declining or moving up, it doesn't make a difference. It doesn't really matter what the economy or the stock market. It seems like gold and silver, they really don't move anywhere. What is your take on what is happening in the precious metals market? Well, you remember, we had a very, very big run in the metals market that began really in 2001 when the Fed started cutting rates uh, initially under under Greenspan after the dot-com bubble burst. And so then we had gold move from, you know, under 300 to 1,000. Then it pulled back in 2008 to about 700. Then it went from 2008 to 2011 up to around 1,900. So you had a move from 300 to 1900, really a six fold increase in the price of gold. Very, very big run in about a decade. Then we had a three year decline in the price of gold and we bottomed out in December of 2015 when the Fed raised rates for the first time. We bottomed out at 10, 1050. Here we are a year and a half later. We're at 1270. So gold is now starting to uh, recover. It hasn't quite broken out, broken out yet, but I think it's built a nice base. It's built a good consolidation. I think the lows are in. I don't think we're going to go back down to 1050. And I think once we break above maybe 1350, 1400, we're off to the races and we're going to go take out the high. So, you know, gold has made a big move and I think it's consolidating, getting ready to make an even bigger move. But, you know, people, you know, lose patience. They expect you know, immediate results and markets don't generally work that way. Uh, they generally try to try your patience and shake out the weaker players. And I think that's the same case here. I think people are underestimating just how high gold is going to go uh, because they're, you know, they don't have the immediate gratification of the instant, uh, you know, reward. Uh, but meanwhile, I've just been accumulating. I've been advising my clients to keep accumulating over time. Um, and I think we're going to be rewarded. 
Now, you mentioned uh, previously that, you know, this is going to be worse than 08. I mean, should people own gold and silver? Will this help them? Will it not help them? What's Why is it so important to have precious metals? Oh, absolutely will help. I mean, obviously, look, I mean, it helped a lot to own them, uh, you know, from 2001 through 2011. You did much better than just owning the stock market. So it adds a level of diversification. I look at it as liquidity. It's a store of wealth. I, I'd rather own gold bullion than own cash. Uh, but I don't tell people to own gold at the exclusion of real investments like stocks or bonds. I still buy those things. I, I've just been buying stocks and bonds outside the United States. I've been buying in countries where I think the valuations are much better and they don't have, you know, you know, this economic disaster, uh, looming, uh, in the horizon. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to work gold into a portfolio. And, and have it as a, a part of an overall diversified portfolio. Sometimes people think I just advocate gold. I don't. I mean, I, most of what I tell people to do is in, for their investments is, is actually in publicly traded stocks. I mean, we collect a lot of dividends on the stocks that we buy. So people have to keep their gold in perspective and understand what its role is in your portfolio. But, you know, the typical asset manager or investment advisor doesn't recommend that their clients own any gold. And I think that's a mistake. Now, you mentioned that we're going to be heading to this period of time where it's going to be a lot worse than 08. When you look at what is coming, what do you see happening? Like what parts of the economy are going to be a lot worse than 08? Like what can people expect to see or happen um, maybe to their pensions, to their savings, to jobs? What do you see happening? Well, one of the, the, the benefits of 08 was that the dollar, which had been very weak going into that crisis, strengthened. And as a result of that, prices went down. Remember, oil prices collapsed from $150 a barrel to $30 a barrel. And so, you know, that was like a tax cut. And, you know, prices for a lot of things went down. And so that alleviated the, the problems for a lot of consumers. I mean, maybe they lost their job, but at least their cost of living went down a bit. So there, there was some relief there that was supplied by the, the, the strong dollar. I think this next crisis is going to be fo centered on the dollar. I think it's actually going to be a dollar crisis, not just a financial crisis, but a dollar crisis. I don't think it's just going to be mortgages that are in trouble. I think it's going to be treasuries that are going to be in trouble. Uh, and so also, you know, from the two, 2008 financial crisis, there were these bailouts. And even though the bailouts did structural damage and prevented a real recovery in the short run, uh, they eased the pain. It was like, you know, having Novocaine when you have, you know, you, you, you know, something, you know, you, 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 you break your, you, you have a broken ankle. So you, you shoot it up with something so you don't feel it. But then the problem is if you keep walking on it, you make it worse, which is what we did. But I don't think we're going to be able to do that. I don't think we're going to have the big bailouts next time because I think it's going to be impossible because it's going to be the U.S. government that needs the bailout. And it's not going to be able to bail out anybody when it's the, it's the, it's what, it's what's in trouble. So I think the weak dollar is going to cause big increases in consumer prices. And so that is going to be a much more painful situation for average Americans, because not only are they going to lose their jobs in the next recession, but everything they need to buy is going to be a lot more expensive. So, um, yeah, it's going to be infinitely worse. And of course, I think Donald Trump unfortunately, is going to be the fall guy here. I think he's going to take the blame for this. You think uh, pensions are going to be in trouble? Well, they are in trouble. I mean, pensions have been underfunded for a long time. And, you know, depending on what happens to the stock market and the bond market, you know, the, the, the degree to which they're under, you know, underfunded could skyrocket. And, of course, the government guarantees these pensions. So that's just another liability that the government gets hit with that it really can't.